it, scru it scrutinizes um, atrocious crimes without any hesitation. And I would argue, definitely, it's one of the most informative books I've read about the Holocaust in a very long while. Good evening, Alex, and welcome. Good evening, Chelsea. Thank you for the very kind introduction and for the opportunity tonight to discuss my book. You're most welcome. We're very happy to have you here. So let's just start with the general question of, and I will actually stop sharing my screen. I'll stop sharing right now. Let's start with the general question of why, what is your rationale for writing this book and what is it about? Yeah, that's a very good question to start with because I think there's a, a temptation out there to, to think not another book about Nazi Germany, don't we already know everything about it? Um, obviously, I'm not of that opinion, and so I've, I've written a fairly substantial book on uh, Nazi masculine. And the rationale is that um, this is actually the first time, believe it or not, that a single book addresses all major victim groups of Nazi mass killing together. Um, so that includes the, the mentally and physically disabled within Germany and, and later in the occupied territories, the Polish ruling classes and elites, Jews across the length and breadth of Europe, captive and unarmed Red Army soldiers, the Soviet urban population, the civilians in, in primarily rural areas who fell victim to preventive terror and reprisals, and Europe's Roma populations, so these seven groups. And taken together, the Nazis killed a total of 13 million civilians and other non-combatants in deliberate policies of mass murder. And for all the, the differences in the nature of the victims, they had something fundamental in common. It's no coincidence that all of these seven major killing programs took place during the war years. And the, the commonality shared by the different victim groups is, is closely related to the military conflict itself. And so while each of the killing programs possessed a racial and indeed racist component, the logic of war was central to the rationale for targeting each and every one of the victim groups, because they were regarded by the Nazi regime in one way or another as a potential threat to Germany's ability to fight and ultimately win a war for hegemony in Europe. Okay. So, so essentially what we're hearing, and just to clarify, did you say 30 million before or 13 million? One, three, 13. 13. So, so the commonality that they all share is that their deaths, the majority of them happened during the war. So a lot of your book, as I know, as you know, will discuss as different campaigns and the ways in which the Wehrmacht operated in different, um, not Wehrmacht only, but other aspects of the Nazi regime operated within, within Europe at that point in time. Um, when one hears the subtitle, A History of Nazi Mass Killing, a lot of people, myself included, of course, think first and foremost about gas chambers. But we know that that was not the only method of mass killing, as demonstrated by the Einsatzgruppen in 1941. What are your key findings with regards to the methods of mass killing? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think you're not alone in, in thinking first and foremost of the, the gas chambers. And I think uh, the extermination camp at Auschwitz Birkenau, for example, has become the symbol of Nazi genocide. Uh, but that's only kind of half the story. Our notion of an industrial, even modern Nazi mass murder is somewhat misleading, given that half of the murdered Jews were not gassed. Three of the five main extermination camps did not possess crematoria. Some of these complexes consisted for the most part of wooden buildings. And the crematoria in Auschwitz were often out of order due to their sloppy construction. And indeed, uh, new technologies or operational procedures for murder introduced at one of the killing centres didn't necessarily lead to a change at the others. So, um, as I said in my answer to my la the last question, Nazi Germany killed approximately 13 million people in the space of less than six years, from summer 1939 to late spring 1945. Starvation in fact, accounted for the most victims, 
then shooting, and only then gassing. Substantial numbers of disabled people, Jews, Roma, and Soviet prisoner, prisoners of war fell victim to each of these three methods. And I think this illustrates how many of the killing operations worked on parallel lines. And in addition to those three principal killing methods, starvation, shooting, gassing, in that order, numerous of the victims were stabbed or beaten to death, drowned, hanged, burned alive, or given lethal injections. And this means that the majority, the majority of the Nazis' victims were murdered using traditional techniques and frequently often at close range with direct interaction between perpetrator and victim. And that, this has obviously been said before, but my book I think illustrates quite vividly that our idea of impersonal, industrialized production line mass murder by the Nazis is only half the story in most. That's really interesting. So uh, let me just ask the follow-up for this starvation. If starvation is the biggest method, then was that, I mean, I know Waring had his hunger plan, but was that ultimately seen and perceived by the Nazi authorities as a key method for killing undesirable uh, individuals within their realm? Absolutely. And it, it's interesting that, um, and apologies if I didn't say that clearly, it's interesting the comment about was it 30 million, 30 or 13 million, because the Nazis actually developed this plan that you've just mentioned, Chelsea, this starvation plan um, against the Soviet urban population. And they intended to murder 30, 30 million through starvation. Um, which they almost certainly would have done had they won the war. The fact, the fact that they didn't starve so many was purely because of um, the unfavorable turn of events from Germany's point of view. But to answer your question, yes, very much so. They, they saw starvation as a method of murder. Interesting, very interesting. Thank you, Alex, thank you. Um, Okay, so for those who may not know me and who may only know Alex, I'm a historian of children. So one of the uh, most interesting things that came out of my reading of Alex's book was about his treatment and, you, and discussion about children. You claim in your introduction that no other 20th century campaign of mass killing, and you're speaking mostly with regards to Mao and Stalin, I think, when you're discussing this, but no other 20th century campaign of mass killing included children. And in fact, the murder of children is a prominent feature of your study. One of the examples I want to read aloud, product placement, one of the examples I want to read aloud is about the murder of 90 children in Balea Terskov, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, which is which was 80 kilometers south of Kiev in August of 1941. So I'm just going to read this for everyone to just hear. The children's parents had been murdered, um, had been murdered earlier that month in a joint operation by the local military commander and SK-4A led by Paul Blobel. For days, the children, some only months old, were left without any food until two Wehrmacht chaplains attached to the 295th Infantry Division, one Protestant, the other Catholic, approached their superiors to plead on their behalf. This is the only documented example of clergy attempting to prevent the murder of Jews during the Holocaust. The protest of the chaplains prompted a staff officer to raise the question of what should be done with the children. The Wehrmacht field commander, Josef Riedel, was convinced that, quote, the scum has to be exterminated. The issue was then brought to the attention of the commander of the Sixth Army, Field Marshal Walter von Reichenau, who decided that the action had to be executed in an appropriate manner. The children were shot by SK-4A. This is obviously very upsetting and a revealing passage. 
Clearly Jewish children, same as adults, were perceived as enemies, but maybe not entirely by some, especially as the clergy had intervened on behalf of the children. Why are children a feature of Nazi mass killing? And why is it something that you have ensured to highlight at various points multiple times throughout this study? Thank you. Uh, before I, I answer the, the question itself, maybe uh, a few comments on my comparison in the introduction of my book with, um, with other regimes, for example, Mao's China or um, Stalin's Soviet Union. While my book is not intended as a contribution to comparative genocide studies, and I do state this explicitly in, in the introduction, I, I do contextualize Nazi mass killings mm -hmm. by arguing that nothing analogous to the Nazis' deliberate and, and premeditated murder of millions of children can be found in the crimes of either Mao or Stalin. And I think the mass murder of children by the Nazi regime is particularly illustrative of how these regimes differed. Under Stalin, children and adolescents doubtlessly suffered multiple forms of physical and, and other violence, but their fate tended to be a different one, namely deportation rather than murder. Hundreds of thousands of kulaks, um, certain type of certain class of farmer uh, in the Soviet Union at the time were exiled with their entire families and deported to so-called special settlements in remote areas of the Soviet Union where they were exploited in the pursuit of, of what was referred to as internal colonization. Few children, by contrast, fell victim to systematic murder. So that is quite a fundamental difference between the two regimes. In China under Mao during the Cultural Revolution, substantial numbers of children were murdered in individual provinces, but again, both the scale and the absence of a planned systematic campaign differ substantially from Nazi Germany. Mm. If we briefly look at other examples of 20th century mass killing, we could point to both the Armenian and Rwandan genocides, during which children were, were systematically murdered in large numbers. Nonetheless, Nazi mass killing was carried out on a fundamentally different scale. And the murder of children in huge numbers by the Nazis, and sometimes in disproportionately great numbers compared to adult victims, was a prominent feature in all the Nazi mass killing programs I examine in my book, with the obvious exception of the elimination of the uh, Polish intelligentsia and the starvation of captive Red Army soldiers. So to answer your concrete questions, um, children were murdered for many of the same reasons uh, as the adults were murdered. They were viewed as a racial biological threat, as rivals for food and accommodation, as potential spies and partisan supporters. And as you can see, all of those reasons related somehow to the war itself and to mm -hmm. Germany's chances of winning the war. And the fact that the, the children were deemed unproductive, worthless, or a burden only compounded their fate. Now, normally these reasons that I've just mentioned sufficed for their murder, so although the Nazis didn't tend to need it, one final motivation for killing children was sometimes, in those cases where adults were killed first, the assumption that the children would likely avenge the death of their parents. So that was an additional reason. And regarding your other question, you're absolutely right that the treatment of theatre children is a, a prominent feature of my book, and intentionally so. The first and last victims of Nazi mass killing were disabled children, the weakest and most vulnerable of all Nazi victims. Mm. And I think that mass murder, the mass murder of children is arguably the most salient feature of national socialist atrocities. You know, from the, from the first victims of the child euthanasia, euthanasia campaign via the 1.5 million murdered children of Jewish descent, more than a quarter of all victims of the Holocaust, to the so-called bandit children in the occupied Soviet territories. You can, there are so many examples you could name, especially young children succumbed to the starvation policy in various occupied territories. Infant mortality assumed horrendous proportions. So the, the ruthless murder of so many children in particular is a crime without historical precedent. And in addition to um, their murder, 
numerous children were deported, compelled to carry out heavy labor, sent to camps or subjected to barbaric medical experiments. Others were stolen from their parents and given up for forced adoption. And the crimes committed against these defenseless victims are, I would argue, quite a vivid illustration of the moral degeneration of the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I was um because they say that the study of children in history really began in the 1960s and that it sort of started. But in my humble opinion, I'm really seeing it explode sort of in the last 10 to 15 years, specifically with regards to war and genocide. And the problem is, is that so many other studies of the Holocaust um, or the Second World War, and I'm also going to include one of my favorite historians of all time, sorry, but Richard J. Evans, he's at Cambridge. Um, they group, he, he and others often will just group children with women, women and children, this concept that that's, that's how you can, you can only put children within that group and relate children to women and to gender. And so children seem to sometimes be lost in, in another conversation about, about another category of, of human suffering, but it's still important, but uh, nonetheless, it seems to muddy the waters so that children don't seem to get that focus. And that was what was quite refreshing in your book because you actually focused on just children at different times to, to acknowledge that they existed in these contexts and not just as a, a subordinate category to another category you know absolutely i agree with you 100 percent chelsea and uh you know as you as you said gender studies has emerged over the last two or three decades as, as an academic field in its own right and as a result and, and after having been ignored and overlooked for so long in historical accounts the experiences of women have become an important subject of research and analysis and rightly so for sure but I think scholarship has been much slower to examine the experiences of children mm -hmm. as a distinct category within a given population. And I think there's an even greater need to do this when discussing the perpetration of extreme mass violence, because children, and I know I've already said this, but it's worth repeating, children are the weakest and most vulnerable members of society, and therefore those that most need our protection. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really interesting. Um, so. Now, when we go into, why don't we look at our pictures next, some mm -hmm. photographs that you have uh, raised or that you have in your, your, your book, sorry. Let me just get up my PowerPoint again. Um, and these photos, let me, sorry, everyone, one moment as I organize myself. Share screen. So in Alex's book, there are, some really interesting photographs that um, I found really provocative. The, the current slide, sorry, I'll get there eventually. I should note that none of these photographs are um, atrocious in any way. Um, they are uh, emotional and provocative, but just a forewarning, they do not contain any uh, bodies or anything of that nature that I'm, that I'm aware of from what I'm seeing. Um, Alex, tell us about these different collection of photos. Where did you find them? And, and can you tell us a bit more about why you chose them specifically? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the book contains uh, 24 images. And, and if I remember correctly, they're taken from about 10 different archives and collections in five different countries. Some of them have been published elsewhere which is how I know about them, but others are previously unpublished. So they're appearing in print for the first time in my book. And the approach I took was simply that I aimed for a representative selection to refre reflect all of those seven mass killing programs that I discuss in the book. So each of these programs is visually represented by two or more images. But the photographs also reflect the range of different killing methods, as mentioned earlier, whether it be. Charles has disappeared. You're back. So I'm just saying. <laughs> I am so sorry, Alex. This person would not go away. I'm very sorry. That's okay. Sorry. That's okay. Don't worry about it. 
there have been there have been there have been more embarrassing interruptions during <laughs> video conferences as we know chelsea no problem so um yeah in, in addition to kind of this representative selection i was aiming at the photographs also reflect the the range of different killing method methods whether it be gassing or um, lethal injection shooting starvation exposure or hanging not all of them show the moments of death and as you just said chelsea the photos we're going to look at now the not photos that show someone actually dying or people actually dying and not all of all of, all of the 24 image, images show the moments of death by any means i think about four of them do and maybe another four of them kind of show dead bodies um yeah, yeah maybe we can look at, at a few of them yeah so absolutely that would be that would be my uh my hope is that we can go through some so what about this one uh we've just been speaking about children yeah. um so tell us a little bit more about the first and last victims of the nazis yeah so as you as you might expect um quite a few of, of my photographs do show children because of the the emphasis on or the, the prominent depiction of children in my book and uh, this particular photo shows a four-year-old Richard Jenner, and he was the last child murdered um, at the Irse Monastery in um, Kaufbeuren in Bavaria, in southern Germany. Um, and I included this photograph because the, the independence of action displayed by medical personnel, German medical personnel, during the the so-called decentralized euthanasia killings of the disabled between late 1941 and spring 1945 is perhaps best illustrated by events at this particular institution, there's a monastery. And there, patient killings continued even after Germany's unconditional surrender on May the 8th, 1945, which, as we know, ended the Second World War in Europe. And in fact, on the 29th of May, so fully three weeks after the cessation of hostilities, the uh, staff murdered a child for the last time um, when the, the head nurse on the special children's ward administered a lethal injection to this four-year-old boy, Richard Jenner. And then the director of the institution uh, recorded the official cause of death as typhus. And um, just to explain how that was even possible, American troops had actually entered the town of uh, Kaufbeuren in late April already, but they were deterred for several weeks from venturing inside the hospital by a large sign warning of an outbreak of typhus. And as a result, the routine killing was actually able to continue beyond the formal end of the war, which I think in itself is absolutely shocking and, and, and illustrates this independence of action on the part of the perpetrators. Yeah. That even the weeks after Adolf Hitler had murdered himself, weeks after Germany had surrendered, these people carried on killing children. Terrible. Yeah. Thank you for that very interesting explanation. It's a very tragic photo. Um, now, uh, everyone, these are not dead bodies. These are clothes, right? Alex, tell us. Yeah, absolutely. These are uh, piles of, of clothing, um, but belonging to uh, dead bodies. Yeah, so they're not dead bodies themselves, but they belong to the uh, 33,771 Jews shot in the Babi Yar ravine near Kiev in Ukraine in over the course of two days. Nearly 34,000 people were shot over the course of two days, 29th and 30th of September 1941. And that was the largest single massacre of Jews in the Soviet Union up to that date. And this photograph is actually part of a series of 29 photos taken by a military photographer um, a member of the Wehrmacht, uh, the German Armed Forces, Johannes Hehler, um, and he, he took 29 photos of the aftermath of the Babi Yar massacre, and, and this was one of them. And you can see in the center of the photograph, you can see um, two 
regular German policemen uh, searching through through piles of, of clothing for, for valuables. And I think the next slide actually shows the the original color version of the same photo, um, and it's produced in my book in black and white, white, but I thought it might be interesting for the audience also to see the original color version. So this is the actual photo that Johannes Hehler took in the, I think the first days of October, 1941. It's, um, it's incredible that an image like this, it struck me. I looked at it a number of times in your book of the, the images that you had and our, one of my uh, staff, uh, Paola, we both stopped on this picture. It made us stop. And while we recognized in the caption, I believe it says something along, like these are the clothes of, these are not the like, bodies of, something along the, the, that line. But the, uh, <laughs> it's so immense. You know, it looks like the biggest yard sale you've ever had of your life, right? And so it's, it's sort of this overwhelming, when you see the possessions piled like that in that way, um, even though they're not bodies in a way, it's almost more powerful of an image, if that makes sense, because they're the representations of, of, of people wearing those clothes, of people living those lives, of people being proud of what they're wearing. And so for it to just be there, piles and piles and piles, those so many people, you know? It's a really emotional image. Yeah, absolutely. And it also tells us a little something about the, the process of um, how these people met their death. Mm -hmm. Namely, they all had to strip beforehand, um, which had multiple reasons. One was, uh, as I just suggested in an earlier comment, um, the, the policemen there are searching for valuables. So obviously, um, it was an attempt to kind of um, rob rob the victims. I mean, theft was uh, was a was a big part of the Holocaust. It wasn't the main motivation by any means. Uh, it was always a secondary motivation, but it was nonetheless, it accompanied the murder um, throughout. So that was one reason. And um, pure humiliation as well, and making the, the victims defenseless, because, you know, it's more difficult to fight back or to run away if you're naked, if you're not wearing any clothes. So this was kind of part of the very cynical um, process of, of dehumanization and uh, that led to the killing. Thank you. It's a very uh, interesting, it makes you stop in your tracks, this, this image. For some reason, it made me stop in my tracks. So, this was another one, quite interesting. Yeah, this is uh, bread being distributed to captured Soviet soldiers in a, in a prisoner of war camp in Vinitsa, also in Ukraine, um, in late July 1941. And it was the Wehrmacht, uh, Germany's armed forces, that was responsible for Soviet POWs. Uh, not the SS, not the Nazi party, the Wehrmacht. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to the Wehrmacht on precisely what scale they could expect to capture Soviet troops. And we know this from um, uh, official documentation from the, the planning phase before the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941. And yet, although they had this knowledge, they ne neglected to make the requisite preparations for feeding and sheltering the captured soldiers because they were viewed by the economic planners and the military leadership alike as German troops' direct competitors for food. Mm. And the number of extra mouths to feed was simply not compatible with German war aims. And um, the obvious limitations placed on their freedom of movement and the relative ease with which large numbers could be segregated and their rations controlled were crucial factors in the death of over 3 million Soviet POWs. Mm. The vast majority directly or indirectly as a result of starvation and undernourishment. So Soviet POWs were actually the second largest uh, victim group in terms of numbers after the European Jews. Wow. Yeah. Well, in this one, um, you know, you hear about starvation, you'll hear about, yeah, clothes even, right? Them, uh, 
victims, uh, you know, being forced to undress, you think about, yep, yeah, starvation. Very rarely do you really think about the, the shelter that they would have at that point in time. I mean, other than it maybe being a wooden barrack, right? But the, the shelter, how are, how are millions of people surviving? So tell us a little bit more about this one. Yeah, on this photo, we can see um, in the center of the picture, we can see two Soviet soldiers, captured Soviet soldiers, digging a, a burrow, um, basically because they did not have any other accommodation. So there was no alternative shelter in the POW camps. I mean, they don't really even deserve that word because they were just a, a, an open field, invariably an open field with barbed wire and watchtowers, but very little else. Um, so this shows two Soviet prisoners of war digging, digging a burrow. And as you can see, with, the, with their bare hands, and I think one of them is holding a metal bowl, that's, that's from 1941. Uh, that was at a, a camp, uh, Stalag 11D, in the province of Hanover. And it was the same in numerous other camps that no shelter whatsoever was provided for the POWs. So by rain and by snow, they lay under the open sky. And many of the internees dwelt in these burrows that they had been forced to dig themselves with their bare hands or, or whatever utensils they had. Um, and... Yeah. This was systematic as well. So for in, in late autumn 1941, this approach was elevated to the status of a general directive in the rear area of Army Group Centre, whose area of operations constituted the largest section of the front. You know, this, 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 was, actually, this was official. This was the official approach to Soviet POWs. Um, and as you can imagine, the cold was a contributory factor mm -hmm. in the mass mortality of Soviet prisoners. Yeah, especially the cold of Eastern Europe too. It's not, it's not a warm place. And again, Soviet POWs, please tell us about this photo. Yeah, um, not that much to be said about this. I mean, as you can see, it's a, it's a photograph showing captured Soviet soldiers, again, in a POW camp. What's interesting about this one is that this is actually, uh, it was taken in 1942. Mm. Um, and so it's a full year into the campaign, but no accommodation, no shelter for the soldiers, um, nothing resembling the infrastructure of, of a camp. And, and this, was, this was commonplace. The, the, an image like this for me, I mean, it shows the, the chaos, but it also shows like the, I mean, it's down to instinctual survival. It's, you know, kill, kill or be killed steal bread or die of starvation like i you would claw the other person's eyes out just to be able to live another day like it's really <laughs> as, as harsh as that sounds that's what this image says to me is just the the chaos of just trying to survive when so many others are trying to do the same right and that's exactly what happened in many cases chelsea you know we know from numerous camps that there were instances of cannibalism um and this tells us less about the, the human beings being kept in this con these conditions and more about the people who put them there and uh, you know, how, they, how they reduced their, their captives to, to behaving like this because they received little or no food. Um, so yeah, uh, quite horrific conditions. And I think this is our last photo that we selected. And this is also the, the one for your, the poster for this evening's event. Right. Yeah, this one shows uh, members of the SS Storm Brigade uh, Dölebanger um, marching up one of the main thoroughfares in Warsaw, um, Quadna Street in, in August 1944. Um, and uh, I, I use this image in my book as an illustration of um, what was probably the most devastating instance of deliberate mass murder in an urban centre during, during the Second World War on the part of the Nazis. And that took place in August and se September 1944 during the suppression of the Warsaw Uprising, mm. during which in a city of about a million people, as many as 185,000 civilians lost their lives in, in the slaughter unleashed by the German forces. 
And the Dulavanger Brigade was, uh, was one of these formations, and it was a particularly notorious unit. Um, before its arrival in Warsaw, it had been one of the most murderous of all German formations in occupied Belarus and killed at a conservative estimate 30,000 civilians. Um, during that time, it had done things like um, forcing locals to, to cross minefields on the access routes to partisan camps so that if the partisans had laid any mines, it wouldn't be the German forces who were blown up, but actually innocent locals, innocent civilians. So that was one of the tactics they employed. And on the first day of its deployment in Warsaw, this unit alone slaughtered 12 and a half thousand civilians. So mm -hmm. that gives you an idea of, of um, the type of unit it was. I think it's difficult to interpret the meaning of the smiles on the faces of at least two of the men on this photograph. But the Dölewanger De Brigade was a particularly brutal and, and sadistic unit, probably in part because it was originally a, a penal unit containing habitual criminals, of which its commander, Oskar Dölewanger, was one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think my book also illustrates that, I mean, <clears throat> maybe. Maybe you, you, you notice this, Chelsea, while reading it, but I think more than just a few Nazi perpetrators were sadists, people who derived pleasure from killing. Yeah. Nonetheless, these sadists still comprised a minority of those perpetrators. And I think that every instance of mass killing reveals a percentage of sadists, just as every society contains a percentage of sadists. And I think it's actually the non-sadistic majority of Nazi perpetrators whose actions we must strive to explain. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of ordinary Germans who killed millions of human beings. And I think dismissing these people as sadists or worse as monsters, inexplicable or whatever, this actually prevents us from understanding you know, how, how human beings can and, and do plumb such depths. Uh, I quite agree. I think that you said that very well. It's a, it's a bizarre photo to be taken at that time. And it's the smiles that make you stop, you know? What is it that they're smiling on? That's a really, again, it's another photo you've, you've very well chosen that makes the reader stumble and kind of question and stop. So very well, well chosen. Um, I'll stop sharing my, I believe that's the, the last one. Let me just try and, yeah of that. So let's go back. I've got two more questions for you. I think we're okay for time. I'll be, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, one of the things, of course, that I noticed in, in your book, and it sort of is a nice lead on from those very provocative images, is that a lot of things that you're discussing is so sort of broad level and, and macro history in many ways that um, you have to rely a great deal on st statistics. So a lot of statistics are really revealing though. You've got, uh, for example, you state half of all victim groups were not Jewish. Um, two thirds of the 13 million victims uh, were killed in Soviet territory. And that in the winter of 1941, captured Soviet troops constituted the largest single victim group of Nazi mass killing policies. Um, but in the midst of these rather, <sighs> enormous statistics which one can get very bogged down in um although you know you don't do that too much obviously because what you do is you punctuate those statistics with survivor testimony and for example for example you cite a very rare letter sent by a captive soviet soldier to his family on the 19th of october and i want to read this to our audience because i found it to be so interesting um, so, captured Soviet soldier writing to his, his family in October of 1942. He says, since the first day of captivity, I've been starving and I expect every day to be my last. We are incarcerated in the sixth fort. We are sleeping in a pit under open skies. We receive 200 grams of bread a day, half a liter of boiled cabbage and half a liter of tea with mint. Everything is unsalted. So we don't, so that we don't swell up. With sticks and steel rods, we are driven to work, though we don't receive any extra food. We have millions of lice. For two months, I haven't shaved, washed, or changed my clothes. 
I have underwear, overgarments, a military coat, a field cap, and shoes with putties. It is cold, muddy, and dirty. Between 200 and 300 men die every day. This is the situation I'm in, and my days are numbered. Only a miracle can save me. So farewell, my darlings. Farewell, my loved ones, friends, and acquaintances. If a good person can be found to pass on my letter, at least you'll know where I met my inglorious and bitter death. Such a letter, as hard as it is to read, um, reveals a great deal that statistics cannot in these macro histories. Can you tell us a bit more about why and how you integrated the experiences of victims within certain passages and sections of your study? Of course, thank you. Um, <clears throat> most of my work uh, prior to this book focused on the perpetrators. And my thinking there was that the, the conduct of someone who kills requires more explanation than the conduct of someone who is killed. And as the historian Timothy Snyder once wrote, it's less appealing but morally more urgent to understand the actions of the perpetrators. The moral danger after all is never that one might become a victim but that one might be a perpetrator or a bystander. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that to be true, but I also believe that the victims deserve to be given a voice, particularly as the generation of survivors is now all but gone. Uh, and for these re reasons, the, the inclusion of often little known but incredibly powerful victim and survivor testimony is a, is a pro prominent feature of my book, as you mentioned, Chelsea. Uh, for instance, um, the testimony of um, Josef Pell. He was an adolescent Jew from Czechoslovakia who witnessed the shooting of his mother and four sisters in late 1941 at the age of 10. And then living on his wits, he somehow managed to survive multiple ghettos and concentration camps and eventually reunited with his father some 20 years after the war. Or um, Yura Ryabinkin, he was a 16 year old Russian boy who lived with his mother and sister in the besieged city of Leningrad. Uh, I use his diaries, his diary entries, uh, which um, pervade the, this kind of this heartbreaking struggle that he's going through, the struggle between hunger on the one hand and conscience on the other hand, pervades this, these uncommonly honest diaries, diary entries throughout December 1941, and he actually uh, starved to death early the following year. Um, and just for anyone not aware of this, today is in fact the 80th anniversary of the start of the Leningrad blockade, mm -hmm. which lasted 872 days and during which more than 1 million people starved to death. Um, I didn't actually, that just occurred to me, I didn't actually um, know that or recall that when we agreed on this date. But yeah, 80th anniversary of the start of the Leningrad blockade. So um, just to come to the end, and my answer, I think alongside this, this moral danger of becoming a perpetrator, which Timothy Snyder spoke of, there is also a moral obligation to tell the victim's stories as faithfully as possible. And so my, my extensive use of survivor and other victim testimony hopefully goes some small way towards giving them a voice and treating them as individual human beings rather than statistics. Mm -hmm. No, it was, it, it's really, um, <laughs> when you get these broad macro histories about this topic, it can feel very much top down, very isolated from the actual experience of it. And that was what was so lovely about your book, because um, just when you think that you're uh, getting into more of the sort of mechanics or the, the sort of operational side of the Holocaust, all of a sudden you've thrown in something like that that terrifying letter um, that sort of makes the person stop and think, okay, this is how the statistics would actually play out in life. And you do that across a number in a number of different ways that, you know, and that's the most toned down one, I suppose, the least emotionally evocative one. There's so many that you've chosen that are really, really poignant um, and need to be said, I think. So I think that your balance between that statistical side and the survivor speaking has been, I think you found that a really good balance between the two. Again, guys, I recommend this book. It's really interesting. 
Um, so the final question that I have for you today. So <laughs> naturally, as we're talking about some of these very gruesome details that come out of personal testimony or gruesome details that come out of just even the photographs, um, it could be conceived that these are fairly uncomfortable graphic details. Uh, there are a number of accounts, obviously, as, as I've mentioned, that are that I found difficult to read, um, quite emotionally upsetting. Um, but at the same time, uh, obviously important to hear their voices. Why do you think it's important to be so explicit in this study? <clears throat> Good question. Um, I do, in fact, and you'll have read it, Chelsea, uh, I do, in fact, include a word of warning at the end of the introduction to my book, saying that some re readers may find this work harrowing to read. Now, uh, this might appear to be a rather banal or unnecessary statement to make about a book with the subtitle, A History of Nazi Mass Killing. Uh, it's kind of obvious that it's not going to be you know, a, a good night story. It is true, however, that I hadn't shied away from presenting the events in graphic detail. Mm -hmm. And my purpose here is not to shock or sensationalize. On the contrary, I think that writing a sanitized version of these events would only succeed in making them appear more abstract. Mm -hmm. So I think that realism and accuracy would be sacrificed in favor of palatability. So I have endeavoured to write a realistic, accurate account. Now, after all, as the saying goes, the past was once as real as the present and as unpredictable as the future. And in addition, as I mentioned in response uh, to your last question, I think there is this moral obligation to tell the victim's story as faithfully as possible. And if my book is emotionally hard to read, let us for a moment imagine how infinitely more difficult it must have been for the victims to suffer the events described therein. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's, it puts me to mind, Alex, of atrocity photography. And this is a major point of contention within Holocaust, um, exhibiting the Holocaust and engaging with teaching about the Holocaust is that how do you do it in a way that is sensitive and yet not, you know, shock, as you said, sort of shock value um, and not almost like a pornography of violence, which mm -hmm. even though the Nazis might have committed that in many ways and shapes and forms, is that how correct is that to show it to our, our young who are learning about things like genocide? And so it puts me to mind, we sort of spoken about this in the past, is mm -hmm. Uh, atrocity photography and actually a study done it, by UCL in 2016 interviewed 72 secondary school students to talk about explicit photographs of the Holocaust and how they felt um, about seeing pictures of dead bodies or crematoria or other violent images. And only one of those 72 school students said that they didn't need explicit photographs uh, to learn about the Holocaust. And thus, what can be gained from a study like that, which I know isn't representative of every secondary school student, but it's an interesting glimmer into how they're, they're feeling. But the majority voiced a need to witness atrocity imagery in order to grasp the reality of the Holocaust and to make it feel more human and less statistical which is really interesting. So, you know, I think that your book hits that mark in that sense is that it's unflinching in how it looks at the very violent and, and terrifying reality of what it was like, which. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I'm just, I'm just uh, digesting this, this figure. I wonder how representative that is, the this, this 72 um, school children um, I would think it's fairly representative because I do think that images, photographs, they do provide a different perspective on events um, to, to written documents. Um, they do 
I think for lots of people make these events seem more real and uh, authentic. Uh, of course, as you said, one has to be careful how one uses them and really place them in their contact, context because it's very easy to take photo, photographs out of context. But I think it's important to incorporate them in, in teaching. Um, and, and I sometimes do that when I teach as well, that I include photographs and, and um, you know, firstly, start by asking what, what do my students see? You know, they, they should tell me what, what, what is their first impression when they see a photograph and then we, and then we contextualize it and discuss what we're actually looking at. Um, and so it was important to me what, what kind of selection of photographs I included in the book and not just kind of 24 random photographs uh, of I don't know, dead bodies or whatever. So th there is a reason behind every one of the photos. Brilliant. No, well, um, you can tell that you put a lot of thought into it. Um, I mean, they're excellent photos that we've seen, but that there's a real need to be unsanitized and truthful and accurate and authentic. And I think that's really laudable. It's not easy necessarily, but that's not the point of writing a book about the history of you know Nazi mass killing, right? Like. If you want an easy read, you can go watch one of my favorite shows, Downton Abbey. So <laughs> shall we uh, take a look at a couple questions? I know we only have sort of two, three more minutes, but um, let's let's start. Shall we go for it? Um, anybody, if you want to ask a question, throw it into the chat function, please. So Cheryl asked, why were some children saved and sent to Germany to be uh, sent to Germany to be adopted, or am I mistaken? She asks. Um, no, Cheryl, you're not mistaken. Some children were saved. Um, even uh, children from the occupied Soviet territories, and I say even because they were generally as Slavs, they were regarded by the Nazis as subhuman. Um, but even some children, and it's a small minority, but some children were um, taken from their families and sent to Germany, placed with a German family. And the motivation behind that was that Nazis thought that these children had Germanic blood in them or could be Germanized um, if they were placed in the right social and cultural setting. So they were basically their, their identity and their language and, and their family, everything was destroyed. They were removed from that and sent to Germany. Uh, so yes, that did happen. And that was obviously also for these children, even though they weren't killed, it was a horrific fate for them to be torn from their lives and, and sent thousands of miles away. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, apart from killing, what kind of experiments were conducted on children? Um, I don't want to, I don't want to go into too much detail about experiments because I think it uh, can be pretty difficult to stomach. Um, Maybe generally? Okay, yeah, generally. I mean, generally, for example, it's quite well known that uh, in certain camps, uh, the the Nazis, the, the physicians working there looked for twins, and then they would um, see if if they inflicted pain on one of the twins or injected one of the twins with acid or something like that, whether the other twin, because by virtue of the fact that they were a twin, whether they would feel that pain or suffer the same injury, you know, uh, barbaric experiments like that. Yeah, uh, just to name one example. Totally. Yeah, there's there's lots out there, but we'll try and keep that. <laughs> there's more reading that can be done if uh, if they'd like to. to yeah. yeah. Um, one of uh, what was the age of the child as classified uh, by child by adult according to the Nazis? This is a good question. I do touch on this uh, briefly in um, one of the chapters. It might be the chapter on anti-partisan operations. I'm not sure now. Um, it varied from territory to territory. Sometimes it was everyone above the age of 14 is an adult and then was uh, classified as such when it came to forced labour deployment or that kind of thing. Um, sometimes it was everybody above the age of 16. Mm. But I personally have taken the approach, and I also mentioned this, I think I took it away in one of the notes at the end, but I, my approach is actually that I regard everybody up to the age of 18 as, as a child, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I regard adolescents as children as well. Um, and that's how I treat them in the book. So when I refer to 
children. I'm also referring in some cases to adolescents. Yeah, fair enough. No, and I mean, that's a huge debate within the history of uh, childhood and children is that what is the age of the child and when did that come and uh, essentially it's a reflection of the society in which a child is defined. And right today's world, we we reflect our values on the child as being, oh, if you're over the age of 18, then you're no longer a child even though that may not developmentally actually be correct, right. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's go for one more. Um, how, uh, no, let's do, 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 do disease. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. What was disease included along with the starvation plan? Because it would be effective, but also risky to those who worked with incarcerated individuals. Again, a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, disease was, not intentionally, not deliberately part of the starvation plan, but the people who um, conceived of and, and carried out the starvation plan, they were very aware that if you, um, you know, if you segregate people and, and put them in an enclosed space and you don't give them medical attention and you don't give them enough to eat, uh, and then the, there are poor sanitary conditions, et cetera, et cetera, that disease is going to break out. This was very, very clear to them. So this was something they accepted. And then perversely, they often used the outbreak of diseases like typhus as a reason to um, dissolve a ghetto, for example, i.e. murder all its inhabitants and burn it to the ground. So the rule of disease here is, is a very, very interesting one. It wasn't actually part of the starvation plan, but there was an awareness on the part of the perpetrators that it was inevitable. And then it was used kind of against the victims. Yeah. Sort of like weaponized in a way. Weaponized, so, yeah, very good word. Exactly, yeah, weaponized. Not just a pretty face. Um, no, but it's, it's, uh, it, uh, it is that that's, uh, disease is one that, and how that interacts with starvation plans of policy. Very good question, yeah. very interesting. Well, without um, further ado, I think we should uh, thank you for all of your fabulous efforts and your contributions this evening, Alex. It's been extremely enlightening. Uh, and of course, thank you to everyone who has attended. Um, but don't leave yet. Uh, if you would like to purchase an advanced copy of Alex's book, please follow the link in the chat. Hannah is on it. She is sharing it. It's an excellent book. I can't recommend it more highly. Um, as we said earlier, we're going to send out an email with a link to the recording for tonight and also a short online survey. Um, and we will have shared the link also in the chat for the survey. So if you want to just take a moment and do that, we'd be very grateful. And please remember, we have plenty of excellent events uh, planned for this coming academic year. So you can follow us, sign up, follow our social media, all that stuff. So without further ado, thank you so much for attending and supporting our charity. Um, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Alex, you've been brilliant as always. This is a fabulous chat. Lovely to have you back again. Shana Tova to all those celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Um, and good night, everyone. Yes. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.